very much, and uh, benvenuti. It's really a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, uh, Digital Diplomatic Series event. Uh, I recognize some familiar faces. Uh, you know very well that uh, since the very beginning, 11 years ago, our Digital Diplomacy Series uh, served as a convening uh, place to discuss the intersection of technology and foreign policy. So we started a long time ago to reflect about this. Uh, we have seen big tech becoming important players in foreign policy and we learn how technology is not just a tool for diplomacy but also a foreign policy priority and how the craft of diplomacy needs to adjust to this new era. Our embassy uh, convened experts from all sectors, government, academia, uh, civil society, big tech and small tech, an average of three events uh, a year, over 4,000 guests in person and as many uh, following our live streams or engaging on social media, more than 150 speakers, 56% 56% of them women, I'm very proud of this figure, um, and uh, um, particularly because, you know, it's a uh, Women's History Month, and yesterday it was International In these past 11 years, uh, we've seen the emergence of social media platforms and their struggles in many areas, including uh, fighting disinformation, which is precisely today's focus. In the last year, we have experienced uh, how Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine has played out not only on the battleground, but also uh, in the information sphere, online and offline, with repercussions on everything we discussed today, to, uh, trust, truth, trust in our leaders and institutions uh, threatened by disinformation, the delicate balance between truth and propaganda, the role of technology in influencing audiences around the world. It makes me proud to come with us today James Rubin, Special Envoy and Coordinator for the U.S. Department of State's Global Engagement Center. It's really uh, nice to see you back. Uh, Mr. Rubin knows Italy quite well. We were discussing this uh, and, and, and knows how our two countries have been collaborating tightly uh, on all the issues and challenges I mentioned earlier, bilaterally in the G7 and within the global coalition against uh, ISIS. Italy has always had uh, a proactive approach to disinformation and misinformation. We have worked at different levels, including in the European Union, in the G7, at, at the UN, and the 2017 Italian presidency of the G7, uh, almost seven years ago, was the first to involve big tech on the sidelines of the G7 Interior Ministers uh, meeting. This is uh, where, for example, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook and Twitter agreed to, and I quote from the G7 statement of 2017, develop solutions to identify and remove terrorist content within one to two hours uh, of upload to the extent it is technically feasible without compromising human rights and fundamental freedom. This was really a, a breakthrough in a way. 10 days ago, the annual report of our intelligence agencies to the parliament identified disinformation together with cyber and energy as key Russian threats affecting European security and international relations. So let me acknowledge and thank uh, our panelists today, uh, Costanza, Giovanni, uh, Crystal, Virginia, Aubrey, grazie, thank you really for helping us shape the conversation today. And final thanks also to our partner for this event, um, globally and young professionals in foreign policy group. Uh, they have been invaluable partners, not just for this event, but several others, including two upcoming events one on trade diplomacy and the next uh, di uh, digital diplomatic series on the future of culture and uh, the arts. So I thank you again for being here and I now uh, think I give the floor to directly to, not to you? Yeah. Okay, uh, but I just want to say thank you for what is coming, uh, James Rubin. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to take the floor again for, for one minute uh, at the 
adding uh, a few words to introduce Mr. Mr. Rubin. Uh, um, uh, Mr. James Rubin has more than 35 years uh, of, uh, of experience in foreign policy and communication. Uh, um, he served in high-ranking positions at the State Department, uh, um, including as Chief uh, Spokesperson for uh, um, Secretary Madeleine uh, Albright. Uh, he worked as a high-ranking officer, as a diplomat, but also as a political advisor, as a commentator, as a professor, uh, uh, as a broadcaster. Uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, he worked uh, in the administration, but also in the private sector, and uh, uh, in the US, but also in Europe for, for, for a few years. He received many awards, uh, I will mention just two, the, the, the Columbia University's uh, John Jay Award for Distinguished uh, Professional Achievement. Uh, and the State Department's uh, highest uh, honor, uh, the Distinguished Service uh, Award. I'm sure I forgot something, uh, I apologize, and uh, without further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you. Tell you what, I'll make a deal with my Republican opponents. If they stop lying about us, we'll stop telling the truth about them. And that's really what I think my job is.
Russians for a long time have been integrated into their system information war, and that's part of their system. And arguably, we've been in an information war with Russia and China for a long time now. We just didn't know it. Um, they've been spending tens of billions of dollars uh, on this effort. Uh, and what's frustrating uh, to all of us is they use low-tech dissemination of false narratives. They use cyber-enabled capabilities to amplify these lies. And then in Russia's case, they have RT and Sputnik and other state-run media outlets to repeat those lies and amplify them. One of the lies is that you know, somehow NATO was encircling Russia. Well, the truth is, uh, the, as NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg recently said, the regime in Moscow wants a different Europe. They want to control their neighbors and they see democracy and freedom as a threat. Um, so they call a defensive alliance a threatening alliance. The truth is that the alliance has bordered Russia since 1949 peacefully, and it's a defensive alliance. There's nothing threatening about it. Uh, NATO's newest members do remember what it was like to live under Soviet control, and they're quite aware of that. And I guess they, they are very pleased that being in NATO will prevent a repeat performance from the Soviet Union in a new guise. But the Kremlin wants to derail Ukraine's democratic trajectory. They want to crush anyone and anything in Russia's way as they try to defeat the democratic values that we believe in. They claim, for example, that uh, the, they were, the Russian troops were sent in to prevent a genocide in the Donbass. But the truth, as we know, is that it's the full-scale invasion by Putin of Ukraine that's causing the unconscionable death and destruction. Uh, this war of Putin's choice, Putin's war, has displaced some 5 million people within Ukraine, forced 8, 8 million to flee, and nearly 17 million are surviving uh, on humanitarian assistance. Um, and those who can't leave are now suffering the incoming missiles designed to uh, prevent heat and electricity from Available to, they've bombarded schools, they've bombarded civilian infrastructure, residential buildings, healthcare centers, hospitals. The list of atrocities grows and grows with each passing day. Um, what's one part of the, the Russian misinformation and disinformation? I've been trying to figure out how to talk about this, and I've, I've, I'm stuck with information manipulation. One, because it sounds cool. Um, and two, because it covers all the different possibilities. And one of the areas where there's information manipulation is about the food shortages around the world. The Russians use this issue even while their ships are blocking the Ukrainian ships from exporting grain to Africa and places where food is scarce. Um, that's kind of, uh, you know, the pot calling the kettle black. They say they're uh, the, the war has caused the shortages when we know that it's the Russian warships that has done so. A second frustrating thing for me is the way in which the People's Republic of China has chosen, as part of its no limits friendship, to fully align itself with Russia in the information space. If you go around the world and look at uh, uh, Chinese-generated media, they repeat these same lies. They repeat the lies about so-called bioweapons factories in Ukraine. They repeat the lies that NATO started this war. And the Chinese do it perhaps in a more subtle way. Instead of just flatly lying, they, uh, I'll give you a for instance, they take a, an African country and they offer to that newspaper, the main newspaper, their wire service for free. So that newspaper has the following result, an African reader is reading African writers in an African newspaper, edited by Africans and owned by Africans, but never in the course of the reading will you see anything negative about China ever written. And you'll see a lot about the United States. You'll see the kind of lies repeated. It's an insidious thing. It's been done over many, many years. And, and arguably, the, the poisoning of the well around the world by Russia and China is one of the reasons why it's so hard to get support for uh, the Ukrainians in what should be an easy call. There's not too many times in international relations when things are as black and white as this, 
most of the time, as the ambassador knows, we deal with 55-45, some policy where you have to argue that the merits of your policy outweigh the, the demerits, and it's a close call, but you make this decision. This isn't a close call. One large country has invaded its neighbor, and to our frustration, there are countries around the world that simply can't say that sentence. Um, I think some of you know who I might be refer referring to. And because of Chinese and Russian information manipulation around the world, the well has been poisoned uh, for many, many, many years. And that's made it particularly hard for, um, for us to get the kind of what should be unanimous support. There are other examples of this. Iran is uh, now uh, part of the, the, the group that's lying to the world about the war and, in fact, arming the Russians with drones that are part and parcel of what the uh, people of Ukraine are suffering every day. Hundreds of drones have been sent to, to, to uh, Russia and have been attacking the Ukrainians. And somehow the Iranians say, oh, no, 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 this, is, this isn't true. Uh, well, we know it's true. Um, I have been encouraged by my discussions with European colleagues. I, I do think people are fed up. I do think that this uh, tens of billions of dollars spent over time by the Chinese and the Russians uh, are, are creating a situation where the West is realizing that the civilized countries of the world are realizing that the democratic world has to respond and not just wait for the lies to be told, um, but also to, uh, uh, to begin to take more active uh, steps to deal with it. Uh, we don't always have to wait for these lies to be told. We need to start identifying the locations where disinformation is taking place geographically, go to the governments who are hosting those uh, entities, and make, uh, make it uncomfortable for those who you know, go to the office every day and type in some lie and think they can get paid 500 bucks and there's no problem. Well, there should be a problem. There shouldn't be such an easy thing to do, and there should be a price paid. So we have to do what we can to, to uh, you know, deal with this flood of falsehoods, to uh, begin to uh, fight back as democracies um, in order to make sure that the future is not a world where these artificially generated fake images are the ones that our kids and our, our people are, are hearing every and I think that the truth is a good enough weapon for us. We don't need to tell lies about Russia or tell lies about China to persuade much of the world about what's really going on. The Chinese government policies, whether it's sovereignty, that you've seen recently the discussion uh, about the balloons, um, it's part of a new pattern where a country that used to talk a lot about sovereignty and saying, don't tell us what to do within our country, is now got a new definition for the South China Sea where the whole thing seems to belong to them or whether they think they can fly the loons over the countries of the world and it's not an invasion uh, of, of our sovereignty, whether they can have these police stations located in different countries to try to police the, 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 the language and the words of, of Chinese uh, in, the, in those countries. Um, and, and, you know, I could go on. Uh, obviously, Russia's war is the central subject matter we're dealing with today. Um, you know, a year or two ago, it was common at a conference like this, somebody would perk up and say, you know, isn't autocracy the wave of the future? Isn't the Chinese model the model that can make the world work better? And, and I think after a year of this war, the democracies have shown their mettle, and the democracies have shown that when aroused, we can be uh, much stronger than the autocracies. We can act with the support of our people across the board, not because they're forced to do it, but because they choose to do it. So I think after a year of, of this horrible war, the democracies are, are stronger, the autocracies are weaker. Um, I know the panel's gonna have a lot to say about this, but uh, let me just uh, end by saying that, that this disinformation discipline is, is Congratulate Italy for being ahead of the curve on, on, uh, on this issue. It's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, the information age has a, a deep, dark, and dark side as a result of what can be done with the internet uh, to lie to, to people and to uh, people ask me how. How do you know when when it's uh, disinformation? Well, one test is if you're an average reader or listener and 
that something gets you angry, it's a good bet that somebody intended to get you angry. Um, that information that's intended to get you angry is often uh, one of the indicators that it's coming from, from Russia, from China. And, and I should say a word, there was a hearing today uh, about a lot of things in, 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 the, in the House, and the GDC is, is often misunderstood by certain uh, parts of our country. Um, obviously, Congress has its role to play of oversight, and we respect that, but the, the entity that I work for uh, is intended for one purpose, and that is to fight Chinese and Russian and Iranian and other nation state and, and non-nation state disinformation overseas. That's our job, to work overseas. Nor do we have any intention of trying to decide what's true or what's not true. Uh, we are intent on trying to prevent Russian and Chinese disinformation from being promulgated around the world. And when we have information that it's Russian and Chinese disinformation, we work with foreign governments and others around the world try to minimize its impact. As I said, I hope we can get a little ahead of the curve and begin to work to stop this disinformation before it's promulgated. But uh, for those who don't understand what the GEC does, uh, let me repeat, we operate overseas. We don't decide what's true and what's not true. We are focused exclusively, and I'm focused exclusively, on fighting Chinese and Russian disinformation, which I would think would be something that all Americans could support without uh, misrepresenting uh, what it is that we do. But I know you're going to have a chance to talk to the uh, to some more experts on the subject, and I hope that I'll hear a little bit about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. Um, I'd like to invite the panel um, to join us on stage. Um, and I would like to thank personally Virginia for um, being with us today. She's in London, so it's like five hours ahead, um, kind of late for her. Um, so uh, our panel will be um, led by Aubrey Cox Ottenstein. Ottenstein, um, she's the co-founder and CEO of Globally, um, a nonprofit organization that builds communities of impact to solve global challenges. Uh, they also lead, she also leads the Young Professional and Foreign Policy Group, uh, the partner for our event today. Um, they span 80 countries, as far as I understand, with around 30,000 30, members, um, many of them also in Europe. Um, prior to Globally and Young Professional and Foreign Policy, she um, was at the uh, Institute of Peace, the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, uh, leading uh, the youth portfolio with the goal of increasing the inclusion of youth in peace and security efforts. Um, and last but not least, she was recently featured in Vogue um, for her recent uh, her efforts to evacuate at risk activists from Afghanistan. So um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you all our panelists. Aubrey, you have the floor. And thank you very much to the Italian Embassy for having us today. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to moderate this conversation, and I'd like to take the chance to introduce our panelists. And just, you'll see that I'm leaning in um, to, to remind everybody that if we speak closer to the microphone, the audio will be better for the room. Um, so with me today, I have Giovanni Ciampaglia. Bear with me, I'm sorry to the Italians in the room. Um, Giovanni is an assistant professor of, the, of computer, or sorry, at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. He holds a degree and a PhD in computer science and is interested in the problems originating from the collective interplay between people and computing systems. Um, he focuses on information propagation in social media, knowledge production in online communities, and trustworthiness in cyberspace. He's covered in many news outlets and we're delighted to have you with us today. I also have Costanza Shuba Canilia. Canilia? Close, I'm sorry. Um, she is the anti disinformation lead at Wikimedia Foundation, where she's responsible for coordinating across the foundation on disinformation and liaising with communities and affiliates. Um, she works with governments, civil society organizations, and academia to um, promote and, and advocate for effective policy responses 
in response to disinformation. Next, I have Crystal Patterson. Crystal is the president of the Washington Media Group, a public affairs firm headquartered in Washington, D.C. She was formerly a federal lobbyist and led the global civic partnership team at Facebook, where she was for many years. Um, she, at Facebook, she engaged governments, corporations, nonprofits, academics, and advocates around the world on global elec elections and civic participation. And lastly, online, we have Virginia Stani. She is the head of business development for the Financial Times, working between London and New York. She runs um, the, she's the director for FT's Talent Challenge Department, and she's looking across uh, new business ideas and revenue growth for the Financial Times. Uh, her job is to keep the Financial Times among the most innovative media companies and being a source for innovation and energy across the media business. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I'd like to start the conversation. First, we're gonna have a, I have a few questions for the panel, but I'm gonna keep my questions brief because I wanna make a lot of time for you all to ask your questions. Um, and I thought, and then afterwards, we will all join um, in the common area for pizza and a networking reception. Um, so with that, I thought I'd kick us off with some pretty broad questions and then we can get you know, more into the, the specifics and have the audience engage as well. But Giovanni, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what's dangerous about the lack of integrity in information online. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think we, um, live, being in Washington, D.C., we, we know about this kind of uh, dangers. Uh, in 2016, December, for example, many of you probably remember the uh, uh, Comet Ping Pong uh, pizza, pizza Gate uh, incident where uh, one person decided that to walk into a pizzeria with, uh, with a gun. Um, so uh, this information, of course, can motivate individuals to certain sense radicalize. But it's much broader than that because, in a certain sense, it's also about the, uh, if you, if you will, the original sin of the internet. The idea that the internet is this beautiful, fantastic, decentralized system where everyone is in charge of publishing and contributing content. There's no central authority. And so there's no notion of what uh, is supposed to be high quality or low quality. And um, we've been grappling with this since the, since the very beginning of the internet. Social media are just the latest iteration of uh, marketplaces of attention where essentially um, we're trying to match people that are interested in consuming something, uh, could be videos on YouTube, could be uh, tweets on Twitter, and so on and so forth, um, with the people that create that stuff, the content. And, um, they have been remarkably successful, um, in part because of the integration of you know, big data, but also artificial intelligence and so on, but uh, we've never really solved this problem. Uh, we've been still, in a certain sense, thinking about the idea that if things are trending, if things are go viral, uh, we just need you know, some algorithm that we kind of scoop up the good stuff to the top, and the bad stuff will just stay at the bottom. Um, this is still very idealistic. It doesn't really work in practice. We've seen it. Um, and, and so in a, in a certain sense, the, the, the dangers to integrity are still all around us. It goes from, you know, um, watching a YouTube video of a recipe that turns out not to work at all, um, which could be just a minor annoyance to essentially having, you know, going down rabbit holes that would radicalize particular audiences. Um, so yeah, pretty broad. Thank you. And Crystal, building on that, you talked a little bit about viral posts. Um, and I'm wondering what makes a post go viral, whether it's true or not, and then what are some of those strategies that companies are employing to um, manage and monitor the information online? Um, well, you raised a good point. The algorithms aren't really built to assess what we like or what's good for us. It's engagement, right? And I think in the early days of social media, the idea was, oh, if people are clicking on something and they're spending time on it, it must be pleasing. This is good for people. We should show them more of it. Um, and I think what we've learned with time is that isn't necessarily the case. And frankly, as more and more content becomes available, the things that get our attention, that make us stop and look, are the things that are abnormal, unpleasant, or defy what we thought we knew, um, which means that that provides a lot more room for disinformation and bad things to pull people's attention. Um, but I'm sure I'm guilty of it because I'll see something and I'm like, wait, what is that? And even if my reaction to it is that I don't like it or that I want to identify 
why it's wrong. That's still telling the algorithm, someone spent time on this, this is something she's interested in, we should show her more of this. Um, the other piece of this, I mean, is that these, these folks in other countries and who are trying to stoke division or trouble know this. Um, the, the part that makes it difficult is they co-opt a lot of the tactics and strategies that work for legitimate discourse. Um, you know, one of the struggles we had when I was at Facebook was making the distinction between traditional campaigns who are trying to get their message out and bring you to their side versus, you know, foreign interference, which is using those issues and trying to stoke division, but for totally different purposes. And making the distinction between those two things um, can sometimes be really challenging. I can imagine. Um, so we've, we talked a little bit about what companies can do or are doing um, to manage and monitor. So I'm wondering what you think um, kind of cross-sectoral collaboration looks like. What, what can governments do with nonprofit entities or organizations in the private sector? How can they work together to, to address some of these concerns? Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question and thank you for the invitation. It's uh, really good to be here. Um, so you touched a really important point, which is really what governments can do with others, like in cross-collaboration. Um, and this is something that I think is really important, and I need to be closer, um, that I think is really important because, so first of all, um, we have seen this issue of disinformation for a few years, um, but technology has grown very, very fast, and government hasn't regulated as fast. Uh, but we have seen a change in this, and now governments are working uh, closely and more on, on policies, but, um, there are different models of the internet, and I think uh, you know Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation would like to really show that there are other models, but to regulate in a way that reflects those other models that are not just for-profit tech, for example, uh, it is important that the governments work with stakeholders and have conversations with civil society, with academia, with companies, um, with us, um, and that uh, I think this really makes a difference in how we think about policies and how we develop policies that work in a way, for example, our model is very much community-led, um, and this, I think, makes it more resilient against false information. Um, it is led by volunteers, uh, but this also means that it takes time to develop the information, it takes time and it's a process, and it's a process also by consensus, um, and it's a process that really tries to get in also voices of people who um, sometimes are less represented on the internet. Um, our idea is really that everybody everywhere can participate in the sum of all knowledge, but to do this, we need regulation that allow this model to exist. And so I think working together really Speaking, so we talked a bit about social media and platforms like um, Wikipedia or Wikimedia. Um, and thinking a bit about, you know, Pete, we talked kind of about organic content creation and user content creation. And I'm wondering from Virginia a little bit about journalism and how this has impacted the field of journalism and what skills do journalists or talent in um, journalism now require that maybe they didn't require um, 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago? Thanks for the question. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me. I uh, believe that what we are discussing here is quite central when we're looking at the new talent that needs to be integrated within the traditional business model and generally the newsroom of the past. Um, we do definitely uh, need audience engagement teams uh, at the FT. We have one, but the, all the main media groups around the world do have them that are made of people that do come from a very different background from what we have seen in the past decades. What I'm talking about here is uh, data analysts and uh, more technical brains that do come along and uh, work collaboratively with the newsroom. So the kind of intelligentsia, the editorial side of the paper does work together not with uh, an antagonist uh, mood, in a certain sense, with uh, uh, the more uh, synthetic brains 
that we can bring into the newsroom or as I like to say, the media group. Also the kind of language when we're looking at the business of media has changed. We were talking about readers until uh, uh, the digitalization and the great change that a data-driven media system has brought us. And uh, uh, now we're talking about users. So uh, the perspective and the way we are looking at the audiences, I believe, has completely changed. People that are using our content, that's why we call them users. Hence, uh, uh, for my FT, of course, as well, that are customers, so uh, people that are buying a subscription. And uh, what are they buying at the end of the day? Is uh, the uh, trust and uh, the feeling of trusting the paper, the research and the analysis that, of course, journalists, but not just journalists, are doing today in a newsroom, in a media group, in a media enterprise. So I think when we're looking at social media and what has been just discussed by uh, the other panelists here is a great uh, volume opportunity to reach out to new audiences. Uh, the colleague here mentioned that not represented or underrepresented groups. I think when we're looking at financial news specifically and financial education, there is a lot of work that we need to do from an education perspective. So to me, as an under 30 speaking, Social media is a fantastic distribution platform that gives us a great volume of audiences that we can reach. But at the same time, we need to be very careful in the way we're doing so. We are not offering for free to the audience all our content, but we need to, of course, uh, and I, I'm going to put this like this, educate, because I think it's, it's, it can be taken in a, in a different perspective, but it's a... Uh, uh, education tool, good quality journalism, that needs to be integrated with academia. And I believe that we have a role, a social role as a newspaper, to think with uh, social media communities, but at the same time, uh, not offering it just for free the content, just to reach as many as possible. I think it's, uh, it's all about the balance and you need talent, new talent, that thinks about these kind of strategies within the paper. Thank you. And I would love to start engaging the audience and having their questions shared with the panelists. Um, so we do have microphones on either side of the room. If you have a question, you'll raise your hand and then I'll invite you to stand and, and introduce yourself and then ask your question. Sir? You'll stand. And Hi, uh, I'm Luca Passani, I'm just a CTO of an IT company in uh, Reston, Virginia. Um, so, uh, there is a little talk uh, about artificial intelligence and uh, uh, I'm thinking artificial intelligence applied to uh, not only images but also uh, deep fake and videos. And then of course now with chat GPT, you can create uh, really credible fake news really fast. So, how does uh, artificial intelligence impact uh, everything you're talking about today? changes were made, what those changes were, 
interrogate what you're reading to understand how and why you're seeing the information you're seeing. Whereas with ChatGPT, the only objective for the platform is to respond to what you've asked it to do. It doesn't have integrity, it doesn't balance truth, it's not you know, weighing anything, it's throwing information at you. And that, you know, that for some things can be helpful, you know, if you're looking for basic facts and information, that's fine. But for the kinds of conversations and complex issues that we're discussing, that does not work. Um, so I'm, I'm, my, my hope is that it forces conversations and also gets us to move faster. I do agree this collaboration and deliberate thought about these things is very important to make sure we're representing key stakeholders and all the issues. But the technology is moving fast enough that some of these things need to move faster. The EU has actually been great about moving on this in a way that we haven't in the States yet, and I hope we see an acceleration of that. Just to put it in perspective, when I started at Facebook in 2014, there was no video on the platform. Um, you, you know, we didn't have, and that, I, I can't remember what Facebook was like without video. I can't remember what Facebook was like without live streaming. That wasn't that long ago. Um, so I know here in the States we get frustrated because regulators don't move fast enough, but the technology is changing constantly, and I, I think we're in a real race to keep up with AI. Sorry, I spoke for a long time. Please jump in. Giovanni, do you have any thoughts? Sure. Your... Um, I guess uh, I would like to qualify that would be the fact that, yes, it's true, you can create very believable fake news with ChatGPT. I guess uh, I would go one step further and say that essentially everything that ChatGPT creates is fake. Some happens to be true just by coincidence. <laughs> um, but, uh, of course, that tells uh, more about us, about the fact that, in a certain sense, uh, we uh, are discovering that conversation is something that we humans are really good at. We are finding, finally, a matching partner. That, and we are, in a certain sense, uh, 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 the success of ChatGPT speaks more to the fact that we humans are so uh, good at trying to find meaning in uh, the other interlocutor, even though uh, we maybe not be even standing in front of them, and so now suddenly we are using uh, um, media and modalities that we are very used to. Um, the, the, the texting and chatting is something that some some young people probably are just just born with it, and um, uh, to um, be confronted with new um, systems in a certain sense, uh, this uh, the coupling of agency and autonomy. Um, we have. Um, um, so this is to say that essentially we are really uh, in a new kind of um, environment where we're really learning now how we are engaging with AI and how, what can we find to be trustworthy in AI. Um, I should also say that the topic of trustworthiness in AI is much broader than that. Uh, AI um, or applications of AI are what, for example, um, deciding uh, what a Tesla uh, car where it should uh, steer or go or, or, or break and so on. So there's an issue of trustworthiness in artificial intelligence that is not just uh, related to these latest developments with ChatGPT, but in certain sense it's really ingrained in the discipline. Uh, we are really starting to think more, uh, as academics especially, in partnership with the, with the platforms and with the companies that are developing these technologies, about what really makes uh, a uh, technology that can be done in a certain sense in a system for us uh, uh, be something that is a trustworthy partner. Yes, I can add something, um, and thanks for also mentioning uh, that you were discussing the difference between Wikipedia and um, ChatGPT and how the information is um, always sort, uh, sourced on Wikipedia and also how you can see the process behind it, which really are the point. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit of a Positive spin on on you know on how AI is used. Um, uh, for example, on our platform is um, AI and machine learning techniques are used by volunteers, um, but always with the human uh, check. Let's say so. It really is a, a cycle, a virtuous cycle, um, and and in that sense, it's really really positive because it, for example, it can flag um, articles that aren't sourced correctly or where citations are missing uh, or um, uh, find uh, potential sock puppets and things like this. So those type of things exist and so there are positive um, applications that, that can be used. Um, we also know that ChatGPT uses a lot of Wikipedia data um, and so we are thinking about how to about that, although it's uh, really early stages. But yeah, just wanted to give a different perspective there. Thank 
video. Another question? Um, in the front, yeah. And then we'll come back because I saw a very enthusiastic hand back there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Alex Howard, the Digital Democracy Project. It's so nice to be back here at the MC. I think that was uh, going to be hosting it so well again. Uh, two questions. Uh, the, the first is, the last part, what are the countries that are doing uh, uh, best, and I would say that uh, definitely countries uh, in uh, Baltic states that have been for a long time close to, that they are close to Russia, um, they have a very good system uh, for dealing with that type of external influence, sometimes it's not exactly external, it's actually internal. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, the so-called ELTS, uh, I want to say that are from Latvia, or um, forgive if there's anybody from there in the audience, uh, who are essentially this kind of core of volunteers that are uh, trained and really good at engaging with uh, um, uh, the Russian trolls that are you know, uh, storming and swarming on social media. So uh, there's of course a strong components, a component of uh, literacy, uh, information literacy especially. Uh, um, those countries of course have, have, have a historical uh, you know, background that's very much connected and so that in a certain sense also helps. Uh, but definitely those are good, uh, good examples there. Um, I'll, I'll speak to, I want to speak to the speed question that you raised. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for acting quickly without thoughtfulness. Um, I, and frankly, I uh, agree. I am glad they aren't moving fast. I'll speak for the U.S. mostly. Um, having worked with a lot of congressional offices and different policy makers here, they deal with a lot of issues. They do not understand digital the way the platforms do or the way experts do. Um, and if you watch any of the hearings, you can see where there was some gap in understanding about these models and how they work, which is fine. That is very normal. I'm not, right, I'm not, I, I, you know, I, this is not to diss anyone, um, but it's just to say these need to be informed policies and they need to be thoughtful. Having said that, we are now, I think, with more frequency, seeing real world consequences for allowing these things to go on. You know, you brought up the comic ping pong example. I live in that part of town when that happened. I went over and met with them to try to help them because they were getting threats, all kinds of stuff online before the man showed up with a gun. And, and also, it basically was disrupting their whole business. Business. I mean, the neighborhood showed up for them, but they were spending so much time dealing with the online hate and figuring out how to protect themselves. It was really hard to run the piece of business. Um, that's a smaller example. January 6th is a bigger one, right? I think a fair number of those people that were doing some of those things probably believe in QAnon, probably traffic in some parts of the internet that I don't even really know anything about, but where these seeds get planted and grow and fester. And, and again, those are small even compared to some of the local examples. So I would just say I still, I, I would be an advocate for more speed just because I do think 
the information moves fast and we need to be ready for that. And also, everybody kind of keeps coming back to wait for the other stakeholders to move. The platform say we want the governments to move. Governments are like, yeah, but you're the experts on this. What should we be doing? And we're doing a lot of pass the buck as real harms are happening. So. And Virginia, I want to invite you to jump in at any moment. I know that it's a little tougher to be online. It's fine, it's fine. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just believe that, um, I just wanted to underline one thing, but um, I do believe that technology, again, is a, a tool that we are using uh, to make quality journalism continue to thrive. I think that when we're looking at um, you know, misinformation and uh, uh, what is happening with the fake news phenomenon, uh, that of course has been amplified with the uh, uh, the digitalization, but has always been there. Like fake news is something that has been always there since uh, uh, news are, are a thing, and even before. Uh, I just uh, believe that we shouldn't forget what are the key rules of good quality journalism. So this can be even seen as uh, I love to always place this on a positive side as well as an opportunity for good quality journalism to make clearer what's the job of uh, journalism, what's the job of uh, quality news. And I believe that uh, we do have an opportunity as uh, media groups, especially with younger audiences and younger people, to make them see the uh, good and, of course, the downside of not being uh, um, relying on quality resources for your information. Uh, and for your diet, for your news diet. And I believe, again, education is actually here the biggest uh, business and uh, ontological opportunity that uh, journalism has today to really continue to thrive. Okay, another question? The person in the back? And then I need a woman to ask a question. Please, thank you. Raise your hand high. Hello? Oh, hi. Uh, so my name is Ryan from Apco Worldwide. I work on U.S.-China uh, political risks, and I just wanted to wind the clock back 20 years because it's a 20-year anniversary to the Iraq War. It was before Facebook, before Twitter, and then we got ourselves into a very dangerous group thing. Right? You had the media, think tanks, eventually convinced most Americans that this was a fantastic thing to do, and of course, this was before all the fake news and all these other things. So I guess my question is. What, how do you see in now the digital age the, the, the dangers of having this type of very dangerous group thing? Is it something that in a digital age it's harder to find consensus or is it something that amplifies uh, the type of thing that we saw 20 years ago? Um, and yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. I can go, yeah. and Debu Mandu. I work in trust and safety at Twitch, and I also work in local government. So um, my question is, how can we get people to understand the urgency of this issue? And I guess there's two parts to this. 
I think you have legislators that don't quite yet, can't grasp the full urgency of the issue. You have businesses who do understand like platforms, and then you have a constitu constituency who understands the urgency, but in a very different way that can come off as if you're taking away access to like mass mobilization, information sharing, things like that. So how do you get people to understand the urgency in a more balanced way? physician and co-founder of the One Health Initiative. Uh, public trust is essential for successful, um, public trust is essential for successful public health. Misinformation and disinformation about vaccine safety and efficacy, as well as the wearing of face masks, uh, really hindered our ability to save lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. And going forward, there's now been an increase in distrust in general vaccines. So what do you suggest moving forward, how we can regain public trust in the uh, influence of uh, misinformation in the digital age? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question in the sense that um, we um, definitely, there's an increasing evidence that a lot of uh, these issues about public health are becoming more and more polarized. Uh, I think um, uh, even with not just you know the, um, uh, um, the the COVID pandemic, but even regarding you know um, different completely different public health uh, situation, and that also speaks to the idea of um, uh, crisis. How you move things during crisis? Um, there's definitely at this point uh, a lot of work that's trying to be in a certain sense converging, looking at many different approaches uh, from uh, literacy uh, to understanding better the role of platforms um, to also trying to uh, understand better how, how, what kind of interventions can we make to uh, improve the flow of and the quality of information. Um, there's definitely, uh, from the academic point of view, as an academic, I guess I should wear my academic hat now, um, I should say that definitely there's a, a need for more data sharing, um, especially when it comes to try to understand the, the role of uh, technology in uh, reducing and, um, and impacting the public trust toward institutions. And um, this is definitely a, currently something that uh, it's very hard. Uh, companies um, uh, do it uh, sometimes most, more for PR than anything. Uh, academics uh, are addicted to certain platforms. For example, you probably heard recently Twitter may discontinue access to its data API, which is sending academics, uh, um, um, everybody's jumping and saying, oh my God, where, where should I go? Um, but uh, this is also maybe a, a place where we have an opportunity for policymakers to step in and for example, mandate uh, um, uh, access to these platforms to improve transparency. Just going to be very, very quick, but on COVID in particular, um, one way that Wikipedia um, worked on, on this is through a wiki pro 
project and also in collaboration with the World Health Organization. And so in, in that case that was really exceptional, uh, the volunteers created a whole wiki project in which all of the articles on COVID everywhere in the world were all connected and rated and the volunteers could just go and see what needed work, where it needed work, and so the community really reacted in a way that I think is a great example. And I, I, I won't take too much time, but if anyone is interested, I think it's a good example of how to work on this type of topics. So if you want to learn more, find Costanza during our networking conversation. Um, last question. Hello, thank you for the discussion. My name is Elise Lavid. I have a, a new uh, media platform for youth called Zivi Media. And I, I just want to follow up on some of the comments that Virginia and Costanza made. When you're talking about um, you know, youth and, and social media, and the statistics show that most youth are getting their information on social media. They don't trust it, but they don't really care. It's not really stopping them from sharing it. So. What do you do when you know the kind of content is they, they don't even care whether it's true? It's entertaining, and so disinformation isn't really a problem for a lot of people. I mean, or or there's not really a kind of effort. And I think maybe I think maybe the answer is more media literacy, and and as you said, trying to identify, make them more discerning media consumers. But I think the real problem isn't only disinformation itself, but maybe the media literacy and, and how do we focus on that aspect? Thank you. Thank you. Virginia, let's start with you. I cannot agree more uh, with you. Uh, I think it's a matter of uh, media literacy, as you were saying. It's, uh, it's really uh, making people aware of uh, how to read an article, how to spot uh, a fake news, how to spot a not well written article as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are missing some of the basic exercises that you do when you build uh, not just the only media literacy, but the critical thinking in people and younger people. Uh, we, uh, or at least this is my perspective or what I've seen in the past few years, we, um, we, we have uh, uh, younger people that are instructed on what to follow and not educated in building a mindset. And I think this is one of the biggest differences you see mainly in primary schools and uh, colleges. I'm looking, for example, at Italy, where I'm a bit closer to, and here in the UK. And I think there is definitely a, a lot of room here of collaboration uh, when it comes to, to um, media and the media groups that do feel they have a social cause because they're a cultural product. They just don't want to make money out of uh, entertaining information, so they don't do infotainment, but they do good quality journalism in entering in schools and turning into a useful tool, tool for professors, teachers, in explaining better the real world out there and connecting students from theory to the real world. And that's, I, I believe, what is a great opportunity as well for newspapers is really to be a bridge between uh, uh, academia and the real world. And uh, I'm saying this because your question is also like, what do you do when the younger people do not care? I do not know if I really agree with the fact that they don't care that they are uh, uh, reading the fake news. I think there are more boundaries now and they do actually held accountable, even social media pages and the unfollow is one step away and is one click away is really really you know is, is at risk in a, also the monetization dynamic in the social media so i, I do believe that uh, younger people are quite uh, attentive now actually to what gets published and uh, held accountable not just newspapers but also social media platforms meaning influencers and so on and uh, I believe that actually there is, a, there is definitely an opportunity for traditional businesses to be on these platforms or at least to collaborate uh, with uh, some of these uh, social media pages to create uh, or at least spread good quality information and sources. 
and uh, IP living collaboration. If uh, maybe you haven't noticed, but it's my keyword. And uh, I, I am a strong believer in the fact that uh, we just don't need to see this as a, an antagonist, but it's an opportunity to spread and to reach more diverse audiences, specifically with niche topics. I guess I should say that, it, that the, the uh, yes, it's true, young people are get essentially all their news through social media and, and um, um, so there's, there's not much we can do there. It's the, I, I, would, I would though right, like to qualify a little bit the fact that the fact that there's this low level of trust is precisely what uh, this information transfership because it's not much about um, um, for especially broader audiences, feeding you know a particular false fact, right? But more uh, so in confusion and growing distrust. Um, now, going back to the particular question of how young people process information and try to uh, make sense of what they see online, um, I uh, uh, many years ago I was a young person myself, and I remember that there was a problem that like they, uh, I was hearing the same like uh, we should you know. Uh, learn how to uh, become better consumers of news, uh, read newspapers, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, I think that, um, that that particular demographic, younger people, are also very good at, in a sense, uh, um, seeking out particular sources that they trust. Uh, I think that uh, there's definitely an idea of uh, having a more direct contact with, say, influencers, for example, and demanding a certain level of transparency. So we shouldn't discount uh, completely the young people and their news consumers online. Um, I'll just say I work with a number of organizations that get young people involved in policy or running for office, and I, I see a lot to be hopeful about. Um, what I keep coming back to, because I think about this, I, I consume a lot of information online. Um, I, some of this is a culture issue, and I don't know that we've created, as, as an older person, in the environment we're operating in right now, I don't know what incentives kids have to be more educated on these issues, because the adults aren't acting like they're always that educated on the issues. Um, and so I, I agree with time. I think we all blossom into being more you know, inquisitive, curious, and thoughtful you know, in how we engage with issues. But I think some of this, I read this, some of the stats on how young people feel about their futures, what we're leaving behind to them, the evolution of policy, and the things that we're arguing about right now. And I don't know that we're creating a lot of incentives for them to be engaged. And so it probably is more fun to watch unboxing videos or you know, silly videos about their, you know, name a topic on TikTok. So I still hope for the future, but I, I also think instead of maybe wagging our fingers at the youngins all the time, we should no, I know you're not. I'm saying for like when we're unpacking this, we're like, what's wrong with these kids? And Maybe it's that you know the adults could do a little bit better to create an environment where they want to learn. Just to finish on the schools, thank you so much. <laughs> and with that, will you all please join me in thanking the panel? Virginia, thank you. We wish you were here for pizza with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for your time today.